information. Air, water, and earth transmit a steady stream of messages that are necessary to keep the cycles of nature going. Human culture needs a similar fine mesh network of communications. Using the art of engineering, we have extended and enlarged our sense organs. The future of the Ericsson Corporation is based on a firm foundation of long practice in building big information systems and networks. AXE, one of today's most advanced switching systems, is a sort of building set where new functions may be added while the core of the device remains. Utilizing the experience of old industrial nations, the young ones develop their infrastructures. And within the industrial nations, new types of interlinking networks are growing. Groups and big organizations acquire their own long-distance connections, beside the established public networks. All networking must commence with a comprehensive vision of the whole. A well-designed, skillfully built network with exchangeable functions is extremely reliable. It's like a brain. The center of command is everywhere and nowhere. Geographical distances no longer prevent us from reaching and informing each other. Our sensory and memory capacities have become worldwide. On the 1st of April, 1876, a shrewd Swedish country boy set up shop on Drottninggatan, or Queen Street, in Stockholm. His name was Lars Magnus Eriksson. Three weeks earlier, on March 7th, an American inventor had got his patent for the telephone, Alexander Graham Bell. Those humble beginnings form the groundwork on which the Eriksson Group is erected. Ten years later, the biggest telephone station in Europe was opened on Malmschildnersgatten in Stockholm, designed and built by L. M. Eriksson and Company Mechanical Workshop. A hundred and nine years later, statistics show that Sweden has the world's highest incidence of telephones per capita. Today, telecommunications and computerization are in the process of fusing into one single huge industrial complex that will fashion the workplaces and homes of tomorrow. The gap between man and technology is closing. Our latest tools are getting more user-friendly. They gradually get more integrated and simplified, though on a higher, more complex and richly diversified level than before. When the 20th century was young, people had at best one phone on their desks. That and the postman was all that connected them to the surrounding society. Modern offices are often a bewildering profusion of telephones and intercoms, telex and telecopiers, data terminals and messenger services. The networks of the future will once again be able to satisfy all needs of remote communication by means of one single integrated package of systems. Aided by simple push-button panels, we may have all the world's talk, text, pictures and databases on our five fingers. The swelling traffic of information requires safe, reliable roads of transport 
that convey many signals simultaneously. Light is one of the best carriers of information. In modern fiber optic cables, it is light that transmits voices, data, text, or pictures. Ericsson puts much dedicated work into developing and improving opto technology. To see the world in a grain of sand. That is what poets and mystics like the Englishman William Blake have tried to do. Now, our engineers have almost made that possible. Silicon sand is usually the stuff that microchips are made of. Most computer programs are etched in silicon. Thus, in a way, they are written in sand. The capacity to store and use information made man what he or she is today. By and by, we have learned to condense more and more information into an even smaller space. Each time we have managed to increase our information capacity significantly, it has precipitated cultural progress. What changes will emerge from the micro grooves of our electronic components, we can still only guess at but they are already the basic raw material of the information industry. With current information technology, a country can guard its territory day and night. National conflicts gradually develop into mere wars of information. The borders between strategic and peaceful technology become ever more difficult to draw. In a time of turbulent transformation, it is essential to be on location when something new happens. Today, innovations often take place in the United States. That is one of the reasons that Ericsson is now strengthening its position there. But the company has already done a lot of business with its transatlantic colleagues. In 1904, Ericsson erected a factory in Buffalo. In 1929, the company joined Bell in building a Mexican network of telecommunications. And in 1932, Ericsson was hit by a severe economic crisis when Swedish financier Ivar Kruger died. In the previous year, he had sold the stock majority to ITT, International Telephone and Telegraph. So for a while, ITT controlled Ericsson. Not until 1935 did the economy improve, and Ericsson stood on its own again. Here in Dallas, we are 200 experts adapting the AXE switch to the North American standard. The monopoly has ended. In the 80s, the Ericsson Group has changed considerably. The product cycles are shorter, the rate of growth is faster, the competition is tougher, and the degrees of risk are higher. But at the same time, the opportunities are much greater. The information age is proceeding to remold our global society, our economy, our structures of labor and employment, our concepts of time, and many other things. Ericsson has entered a new era. The most interesting and fascinating phase of development lies ahead of us.